so um, thank you everyone for uh, for showing up today and and for giving us your time. Um, we're here today because we are all struggling with scale. So increasingly, businesses are challenged to scale to additional geographies, to more users, and to greater uptime, particularly in the electronic trading industry. You're being asked to scale out your trading operations, your listing operations, and your market data products. But you may not realize that in order to um, take advantage of the scale that cloud service providers can offer, you have to be able to transfer your data from a kind of classic finance data model into a more cloud-based or kind of web-based data model. So cloud service providers, you already know, are going to be critical enablers of that scale. But the challenge is how do you get your data from where it is now into a, kind of a, a cloud model? Um, and you may be facing a scenario today where you have a very fragile data model, where even including a small change like an additional data point winds up being a really time-consuming dev effort. So what we want to talk to you today uh, about is how you can have a, a more um, robust uh, data operation. So really what you need in the end is a data operation where a small change like I just described, or even a big one, can be handled as a business as usual event. So changing your data model should be a business as usual event because in fact, it already is a requirement that, that you encounter every day. So we're gonna talk about three things today. The first thing is about two different data modes or two different data worlds. And uh, next, we're going to talk about an approach for kind of bridging those two worlds, so an approach for kind of bringing data from one of these worlds to, to the next. And then finally, we're gonna talk about in practice, um, how has that approach served us? So Sal is gonna talk us through the two market data paradigms. Thanks, Matt. Um, so broadly, we're gonna talk about a little, so a few cultural stereotypes between Wall Street, Silicon Valley, East Coast, West Coast beef. Um, so Wall Street, there, one way that you can look at it is the ethos is if the system goes haywire, we'll be, fraud, we'll be um, insolvent in 15 minutes. Things like this has happened. Um, in 2012, a market-making firm lost $440 million in 45 minutes uh, because of a DevOps issue. So this is real. Uh, move slow, don't break things, right? The inverse of the traditional Silicon Valley ethos um, takes 10 years to get an industry-wide audit trail rolled out. So the focuses are stability, reliability, uh, determinism. These are like the cultural uh, pillars of, of Wall Street stereotypically. Silicon Valley, a little bit different. Uh, if this thing could scale, if this thing could scale, we'll be cash flow positive in six years, right? We just had our, our 500 million uh, Series D or whatever, right? You know, um, move fast, break things, right? Uh, growth, accessibility. These are the priorities behind uh, Silicon Valley. That also bleeds into the tech stereotypes that we, we observe in, in both sort of cultures. Uh, Wall Street favors low context encodings. That means that um, from the payload itself, you can't really determine what's in there. You need some sort of uh, schema definition or, or mapping there. Uh, you just have a, have, have a bag of bytes because the messages that go through are about 40, 50 bytes, 100 bytes long. Um, there's there's a, a preference towards physical co-location Racking and stacking servers, it still happens. You have to co-locate with the exchange in many cases. Um, it's optimized for transaction throughput. Um, you know, how, many, how, many, how much can we squeeze out of our existing expenditures? And um, it, there tends to be an overarching focus on precision and demanding precision. On the other hand, Silicon Valley has high context encodings. Uh, this, things like JSON, perfect example. Let's just fling curly braces down the wire as much as you want, um, even though they don't mean anything. Uh, metered computing, cloud computing, right? This is something that lets uh, application developers uh, just innovate much more quickly. And developer throughput really is the priority in a, in a Silicon Valley mode. Um, there's a lot of tolerance for ambiguity because in a startup culture, um, there's tons of ambiguity. So it's sort of rolled into the culture, as you will. So bringing it back to 
exchange data, high performance market data, there's really two ways if you wanted data directly from the exchange uh, to pro provision it right now. The first requires standing up a whole lot of servers, getting a cabinet uh, programming to a PDF spec in some multicast protocols where you're just getting packets blasted at you indiscriminately. Um, and, and that's really what the, the essence of, of what they call high frequency trading, direct exchange trading, direct market access, that's what that involves. Uh, and that is obviously all that data comes real time from the matching engines. On the other, your other option is basically at the end of the session, they'll give you a replay file of all the packets that were sent during that session, uh, a packet capture file, and you get that uh, secure file transfer. Um, and essentially, both distribution types have the same exact types of message, have the same exact content of their messages, but they're being delivered in a um, in, in a separate way. So what Matt's gonna gonna tell us about now is sort of how we approach the problem of solving this to get it into a cloud native format. Thanks a lot, Sal. So so Sal just kind of brought us through the you know in practice the way that you actually get your hands on um, on really high resolution market data and and it's um, you know it, it's it's usually via kind of an end of day binary log or um, or, or via this kind of like real-time colo um, model. But increasingly in the electronic trading industry or, or kind of in financial services, you in this audience are hitting these requirements where you need to bring the data from that kind of model into, into a new model. Um, so, for example, maybe you need to get price messages uh, to a web front end. How do you actually, how do, you actually do that? Um, or let's say you want to get a full depth of book feed for you know a one week period into uh, a data warehouse so that you can do data analytics. How do you do that? Well, when you're being asked to do that, really you're being asked to bring uh, to, to to bring a message from one of these little Rubik's cubes to another, essentially, right? So so this uh, let's let's say that you have to bring a price message from a feed like Sal just described. To, uh, to a mobile device. Um, you're being asked to go from, to take a BBO, a BBO message that's coming, over, um, that's coming over UDP in SBE encoding, and you're being asked to keep that message the same, so still a BBO message, but, uh, but instead you want it to come over WebSockets, um, you want it to come over WebSockets in JSON, right? So you're being asked to really move it from like the little black callout to the little yellow callout. Now, an interesting thing here is that we're not talking about transformation. We're not talking about ETL. So if we were talking about ETL, nobody would be here right now in this room. Um, we're talking about something different. We're talking about actually non-transformation, right? So we're not, we're keeping the message the same, the contents and the meanings, the meaning of the message the same, but we're lifting it from uh, we're lifting it from one encoding and one transport and then moving it to another encoding and, and transport. So carrying the same information, but just kind of across these two data worlds. Um, so we've thrown some terms around here. Um, we've talked about, you know, SBE, B, BBO messages, SBE, and, you know, messages coming over WebSockets or UDP. Let's organize our thinking a little bit more. So... As we were sort of working on these types of problems, we, we ended up having to sort of create these abstractions that we've thrown around that, that we found very useful in solving the problem of not transformation, but transcoding. And really, I mean, these are all things that, that terms that get thrown around, but the fundamental concept here, the fundamental abstraction is the message. The message is basically any payload, it could be an API response body, it could, could be a, uh, a message, an SQL, you know, rogue coming back, but it essentially, identifies a set of a, a instance of a, of a data model or an instance of a schema. The schema defines the data model. So it defines what the semantics of what a particular message conforms to. So like Matt was referring to BBO, best price messages, right? A best price message is basically going to have at least a symbol and, and a price, right? Um, and potentially a quantity. Um, that gets defined in a schema, preferably machine readably, so that you, know, you could do downstream automation. The encoding is essentially the presentation layer where, where how the message is interpreted by the ultimate consumer or producer. And you know, these are your, your things like fix, pro, fix or JSON or SBE or YAML and things like that. Then the transport is ultimately the input output medium that the messages will flow through. 
but a single message has these three characteristics, and across the other three characteristics, they could be hot swapped without changing the semantics of the underlying message. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Sal. So, really, what we're what we're saying here is that um, in in this industry, increasingly, you're going to need transcoder applications because you're going to hit these use cases where you have to bring um, the same information from you know one transport and encoding over to another. Um, you could change the schema while you do that. Um, Maybe you need to, maybe you're not, depending on, maybe you don't, depending on the use case. Um, but the point is that you need a transcoder to move information from one of these Rubik's cubes to another, meaning to take a BBO message and move it from a certain transport like UDP and a certain encoding like SBE over to another like WebSockets and JSON. You need some application to do that. Um, so why do you need an application to do that? Um, so to, to, to be a little more concrete about it, cloud services, we believe, are going to be critical enablers of scale. You're going to need to scale out geographically increasingly. You're going to need to reach more users. Um, it, increasingly, cloud is probably part of your strategy to do that. Cloud APIs expect a different transport and expect a different encoding from the kind of colo environments that, that Sal is expecting. And we find in this industry that we see a lot of, uh, in, in our industry, in, in the cloud industry, we think that maybe too many people wave their hands around that part of it. So it's kind of like, take your full depth of book feed and just get it into an analytics warehouse. Okay, well, how, right? Like, these messages don't turn themselves into JSON. They don't turn themselves into Avro. They don't magically <coughs> jump from UDP to HTTP. And that's really the problem. Um, and so, um, you know, we're proposing uh, that as you develop transcoder applications or as you use one that we've open sourced, um, you really have these three separate concepts of transport, schema, and encoding in mind because those concepts will let you really kind of like isolate uh, different parts of the code and, and develop them in, in isolation. Um, as, as a result of using these ideas, um, you, you, can, you can potentially get a ticker plant in the cloud with um, different kind of logical components neatly separated. Um, next, we're going to take a, a look at the life of a transcoded message. And this is really the essence of, of how you do this in, in a sort of algorithmic way. Um, but, you know, in the case of uh, electronic trading and, and being on sort of a multicast network, you would get a packet in. You would have to strip any extraneous uh, things from the payload. So if you're getting a UDP packet or you're, you're parsing it out of a PCAP message, you might have 12 bytes that have no meaning that you, that you need to take off first. So really what you do is you isolate the payload out of um, the message payload from the, the, the delivery transport, right, the inbound transport. Um, once you have that message byte, the, that byte array uh, payload, you have to ID, what is this? What makes this more than an array of bytes, right? So this is where machine-readable schemas come in extraordinarily handy, and you, you essentially say, okay, um, by convention, you have this, these, this byte offset is what's telling you what type of message, right? So the message type is something that is very, uh, another abstraction that is, is, is very core to this type of approach. And once you identify the, um, the type of the message, then in the machine-readable schema, you would say, okay, what are the byte offsets, right? Applying the encoding to the bytes that you have that actually give it some meaning, and that's generally happening in some host programming language like Python or C or, uh, you know, in, in C, actually, the trick is really you just map a struct onto the byte array, and you pretty much have something that you could use within uh, the host language. Um, then it's a matter of understanding what your output format, what your output encoding is going to be and what your output transport is going to be. Um, it's inside that host language. You would essentially remanufacture, uh, while losslessly, um, remanufacture a new object with a new encoding, a new serialized sort of uh, uh, encoding of the object uh, for the destination um, encoding. And then it's a matter of basically out the other end, sending it, uh, sending the transcoded message over the outbound transport. That could be writing to a file, could be sending to another network. And these are sort of abstract 
algorithms and, and, and metaphors that we found extraordinarily useful while we were building something. So um, Matt's going to show us a little bit about what you get when you could approach things like this. So thanks a lot for that, John. This slide shows that after a message is transcoded, you need to put it somewhere. And it also shows that in the cloud, uh, in, in, in really any kind of cloud service, there are kind of infrastructure abstractions that perfectly match the messages that come out of the transcoding process. So uh, imagine that you have a schema and you have a transcoder that's, that lets you bring your own schema. So you, you, have, a, you have a transcoder that accepts a, a message schema as a parameter. And, and uh, the good news is the transcoder is, is, your transcoder is now smart enough to, to kind of decode any feed or any file that it encounters because you can bring your own schema. Well, okay, that's good news. You're able to pass it a schema. It's able to respond correctly. It pulls out messages. But now that it's pulled out those messages, where does it put them? So if these decoded messages are bound for a table, the table also needs to have a schema. And that schema needs to be completely aligned with, with the message itself. So what we're proposing here is that if you're, if you're really, in, in our view, if you're really going to be working with market data and taking advantage of these kind of cloud-native syncs, like data warehouse or, or, a, or, a, or a topic, some kind of messaging bus, what you want to do is you want to embrace this idea of infrastructure as schema. So we've all heard you know, the buzzwords like infrastructure as code and also infrastructure as data, where you can begin thinking of your infrastructure almost as you know, in a Kubernetes kind of like list of, of kind of objects sort of way. But what we're saying here is that if your schema is enough to inform um, your transcoder about what messages it might encounter, it should also be able to inform your cloud service about what kind of infrastructure to stand up. So if you have something like, uh, like, in, like a, an order cancellation message, in one kind of atomic operation, you should be able to tell your schema that message exists and here's what it looks like. Sorry, tell your transcoder that that message exists and, and here's what it looks like. But in one atomic operation, you should also be able to tell your cloud service data warehouse that message exists, that here's what it looks like, and please spin up a corresponding table. Oh, sorry, this is yeah. mine. My bad. Okay, so, so th this slide is meant to show the point of getting your data into a cloud environment. Um, so far, we've been talking about it like it's just a given that you want to get that you want to get your cloud, that you want to get your, your financial data into a cloud environment, but it may not be a given to you. So, why do you want to do it? I think, from my perspective, there are really two big reasons. Um, not just two, but these are my two favorites. The first is that there are there's a really rich and performance set of analytical tools that are available in cloud environments now, and they do not require you to take to take on a lot of additional operational overhead. Um, it can be difficult to make sense of some of this really, really dense tick data in, in any other kind of environment. So that's one reason you might want to do it. The second reason is that um, distribution in, uh, in a cloud uh, environment, particularly a cloud environment with a global backbone, um, may, uh, may really surpass um, the kind of global distribution capabilities that, that this industry has today. Um, cloud, I think, increasingly is, is competing with some of like the traditional kind of global networks. And so if you get your data into, um, into a cloud environment via the kind of transcoding routine that we discussed, you can do more analytics with fewer people faster. You can also reach, you know, is, uh, an exchange in Chicago can, can, can reach... Um, can reach participants in you know Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia really trivially without any additional lift. So those are the compelling reasons for doing it. So, thanks, Matt. Um, so we're going to talk about in in more concrete terms, sort of how we um, 
we saw this problem as sort of like a meta obstacle to getting wider cloud adoption uh, of electronic trading data. Um, and as we were sort of working through this, these problems and we sort of see them coming up again and again, you know, we just started thinking what would be easy to do this? And what we've noticed about, it, about similar tools is that a firm will do something like code to a, a itch protocol spec and they'll do it only to the point where they get their own accomplishments completed. And then sometimes it might actually be open source in a lot of ways. There's a lot of excellent, excellent software out there that does that. But there's nothing that really expands it to a wider set of abstractions. So what we did is that we released, uh, I believe it was a few weeks ago, um, what we're calling a market data transcoder on GitHub. And uh, we're going to show you a little bit about what it looks like on the user surface and how these abstractions uh, bleed into the user surface of this. Um, and essentially, there's a set of parameters. And, and our nickname for this tool is FFmpeg for market data, which is uh, FFmpeg is a video transcoding tool. The list of options uh, at, on FFmpeg is sort of like the menu at Cheesecake Factory. It's like it's endless. So um, this sort of, because you have a lot of options, you have a lot of input-output options, a lot of encoding options. We've sort of, uh, that sort of bled into what we see here. But the options that you set are source file, right? What, what kind of, where is this coming from? Where is this data coming from? What is the format type? Is it line delimited? Is it length prefixed? Um, what, what destination is it going to? Um, what is the schema file that we're going to use? I mean, if nothing else, you need to supply sort of the schema file. And um, if you're not taking it from an input stream, then you basically specify an out, uh, some input identifier. And then you define the output types. Like uh, uh, in this case, we're showing an output type of BigQuery. And what happens through this process is that you, the transcoder will read the schema file and then actually manufacture um, the equivalent schema in BigQuery. And we learned a lot of practical lessons in this case. Um, one of those lessons is when you only have market data incremental refreshes uh, in your data, you don't want to create the entire fix 5.0 schema graph inside your BigQuery. So this led to uh, 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 an option we have called message type inclusions, where you might have only one message type in the data that you're, li that you're looking at um, but your schema may contain a, a much broader library of messages. Um, and that's one of the ways that this really, the, the real world sort of bled into the options that we offer in, in this tool. Um, I think Matt's going to tell us a little bit more about sort of how, one of the obstacles we encountered. So, so thanks a lot, Sal. So, so Sal was bringing us through, through the user surface. And, um, and behind that, of course, we have the source code. And, and originally, we, we had this dream that the source code um, would, uh, or, or I guess that the application could be insulated from any kind of um, protocol-specific logic if we just used those three abstractions of schema, uh, transport, and encoding. And when we really thought, you know, if we, if we get this right, um, then you, you should be able to bring any protocol, and, and the user shouldn't ha ever have to write code. Of course, at a certain point, that dream kind of met reality, and, and we, we did encounter, I think, at least one edge case that required kind of uh, protocol-specific logic, and that was right here um, for, for, the, the itch, um, for the itch protocol. Um, for certain flavors of itch, and I think this is what, four, I can't remember what version, I think it's like itch four, but we were working with a particular exchange, and uh, they were using a particular itch protocol version, and in that version, um, there was no complete timestamp on each message. So a, a particular message would actually give you a fragment, like kind of like the nanosecond fragment of a timestamp, but then separately you had to read these kind of current second messages and keep track of the prevailing second. So what we realized is that we really were hesitant to have any kind of protocol-specific logic until we kind of you know, got the transcoder dumping into BigQuery. And then we said, um, we have a bunch of messages with nanosecond, times, nanosecond values only, and we can't actually arrange them sequentially, and therefore we can't really say to anyone that this is useful. And, um, and, and so uh, what we realized is, okay, we still want the user to be able to not deal with the source code. And so we introduced this idea of a message handler class 
um, so that we, we have message specific logic that kind of for each tracks the prevailing second and then combines that with the nanosecond and then actually puts kind of a, a really meaningful timestamp into BigQuery. Um, the good news is that we wrote that message handler and if a user you know, goes into the repo today and clones it and wants to use, wants to decode an itch file, they can do that just by passing that particular message handler as an option. Um, and if other hiccups like this are encountered in the future, contributors can write their own message handlers and users can, can pass them. And one thing I would just say on that, it was very important for us to transcode losslessly um, by default, right? Like not lose any data that's coming in through a depth of book feed, right? Don't conflate data. Um, and in this case, you know, we, we really wanted to do one-to-one, -one, but in this case, as Matt said, that data is absolutely useless if you don't have the full timestamp in a SQL perspective, right? So um, what we did is we basically gave it the ability to add an extra column that would represent, or an extra field that would represent the entire timestamp. And in that case, I mean, I would say that, that we kept the spirit of losslessness, even though we had to add a little bit of extra data so it could be useful in other contexts. And I think there's just one thing I would add. I think that the, the lossless idea is, is really important. So the transcoder, in a way, I mean, we were talking about how what we're doing here is sort of like non-ETL, non-transformation. Um, the, the transcoder is trying to really change nothing and trying to just get every record as literally as, literally as possible into, uh, into, a, into a sync. That sync might be an Avro file, which we support. Um, that sync might be a BigQuery table, might be a, a pub sub topic, and, and the community can kind of add additional ones. But the point is, we're trying to just get a direct kind of message by message copy in because we think subsequently, in subsequent operations, that's where you're going to try to get, try to get insights out. That could be, you know, using DBT to really like execute SQL or et cetera. Okay, so I just wanted to recap um, what we what we've gone over today. So first of all, we talked about how there are two data modes or two data worlds, and we're kind of clumsily calling them Wall Street and Silicon Valley. Wall Street um, tends to favor, you know higher context, uh, or sorry, lower context encodings um, and, and kind of stability. Um, and, and Silicon Valley is more about kind of high context encodings and the ability to kind of scale. Um, and so uh, increasingly you're going to be asked to move data, we think, really from kind of like the, the classic finance world into a more, more web-based or kind of cloud-based one. Um, so an approach that will help you do that we think is to really keep these three ideas of, of schema, transport, and encoding at the center of your development. Um, and, uh, and then finally, in practice, um, we found that those ideas actually were useful. There were some moments where we had to kind of depart from them a little bit, but, but they really did help us with our application. And of course, we would love it if you would check out our application, um, which, is, which is on GitHub. Um, it's just called the Market Data Transcoder. And there's one thing I want to leave you with. Um, you may find this all a bit daunting, or maybe not, I don't know. Um, you may be thinking to yourselves that transcoding and keeping these ideas in mind and, and just generally like kind of moving your industry into the cloud, this may all be somewhat disorienting. Um, you may be encouraged to know that you wouldn't be the first to do this. So about 150 years ago, Julius Reuter noticed that there was a gap um, between two telegraph networks. And um, the, the network edge went up to Aachen um, in Germany, and then there's a 75-mile gap, and then it picked it back up in Brussels. And so as a temporary solution, while, while the Reuters Corporation was waiting for that gap to actually get closed, they actually employed um, carrier pigeons. I'm not sure how much they paid them, but they were, they were, <laughs> they were employed. Um, and, and so... And so, the, but they actually did use carrier pigeons to get the to get the prices um, at at one part of the network edge, and then put you know put the put the information in an envelope, and then have the pigeons actually fly it to the other network edge, and then and then you know put it back into the telegraph. So if you think about that, 150 years ago, those those concepts were still totally intact, right? So the scheme the the transport was going from telegraph to carrier pigeon and back to telegraph. And the encoding was going from Morse code to, to French cursive back to Morse code. 
but the messages were remaining the same. So those ideas were helpful then. They're absolutely critical now. Um, we hope that you found this helpful. And if we have time, we're happy to take questions. So, uh, two things. I'm uh, interested about you don't approach the idea of completion. So typically, I would expect to be going into clouds and be sort of thinking about how to second or something in a, of an exchange at 1,000%. Right. Down. Well, so the way we actually approach it is 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 really conflation be damned at least initially, right? So so we're prepared basically with this this tool is prepared to take unconflated data. It was actually the motivation for this tool was because we needed unconflated data and we didn't want unconflated data. We wanted source data, the, the so lossless source data. Now. There's definitely some, some you know, you, you look at the high-performance iron networks in co-location, right? I mean, you're not, you're not going to, on a consumer broadband connection, you're not going to be able to compete, right? So there are downstream tactics that you need to use in cloud, potentially, potentially sharding on more symbols, right? Sh you know, figuring out what your, your sort of output channels are and sort of balancing them out. But for this, um, in, a, in a use case that, that we're imagining, the conflation would be, downstream from the production of the transcoder or the output of the transcoder. Um, there's one option we're considering, which would basically allow you to shard the output of the data based on s dimensions in the source data. So like, let's say security ID, right? Uh, this, I, have a, I have a channel that's coming in multicast. It might have any number of security IDs in it. Well, let me send those out based on out to different transports based on the individual security IDs. We haven't done that yet, but that's an idea that you could use to sort of shard based on namespaces or shard based on output channels and things like that. I didn't have a follow-up. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, the news time stamp is a classic piece of image updates semantics. If you get your block bringing in from what you're seeing here, you assume with every message you're processing as an image effectively by the time it gets to the store. The follow-up from that is it's interesting to look at your consumption uh, use case might want to look at, uh, you know, the TCA analysis, what was happening across several exchanges. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so the extent to which you showed three classic uh, cloud-type storage, that you see some of the existing time-based, um, uh, time-series databases being relevant to the cloud, mm -hmm. or do you assume you're just going to crunch numbers and you pull out uh, all the trades within a five-second well, window or something? Yes, yeah, so that's a great point. So, I mean, like the the... SQL example that we gave um, is, is very relevant because we literally, if we did one-to-one, -one, we you would have useless data inside the SQL database, right? So we, this was sort of something that we felt forced to do based on a, let's call it a protocol artifact or protocol, you know. Um, in terms of, you were, you were asking about um, TCA, T, TCA and things like that. So, so this is interesting because if, if let's say we were, we were writing out to like, let's say file systems or, or cloud storage, right? You would have to make some sort of uh, determination with how is it going to be consumed, right? So if you have on a pub sub topic, let's say, and you're broadcasting messages one-to-one, -one, let's just say a single multicast packet that came in over UDP, you're, you're putting that on a topic. You obviously would have to have a sequence number, so you, have some, some ra you could rationalize it. Um, but, it, it, you know, you would expect that the consumers of those topics would be able to piece together what they need. I know that in SQL, if I take away that, if I don't have that timestamp, there's no way for you to get that back because it's, it's, it's just lost in the ether. You, you yeah. just can't get it back. You never so, persist it. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. We have another question over here. I want to make sure. Yeah. Can... Thank you, I, I Leslie. Like, I work a lot with like, open source technology, specifically with Apache Kafka. Oh, cool. I, so, I, so it's, it's an interesting question. I, the way that we the way that we think about this is that um, it, it it cooperates with things like Kafka, and I think it enables some analytics use cases that actually have nothing to do with with streaming. So, so here's here's the way that I think about it. First of all, I think things like Kafka are still really important in a production pipeline that uses the, the, the transcoder. So. To give an example, we're working with a particular exchange. We're working actually with a handful of exchanges right now. 
One of them needs to give us, all of them are going to need to give us ordered data, and we need to have a guarantee that that data is ordered Absolutely. by the time that we get it. Yeah. And we kind of don't care. So at some point on-prem, they need to order that data right, right now. And we, we kind of don't care where it's coming from. We, we just we want to guarantee that it's, that it's ordered and that, it's, and that it's not uh, that there, there, there are no gaps, right? that it's gapless. And one particular exchange is doing that on-prem right now with, with Kafka. So then the question is, why do they, why do they bother giving, giving it to us? And I think that there are two reasons. First of all, we're putting it into, um, into a database that, that allows for really massive analytics. Um, not not real time analytics, right? So that's that's one reason. Um, the second reason is that the global distribution of that data for people who are not latency sensitive is really really ops light for um, on on a platform like ours. Yeah, and I, I think we see that naturally. I, I work in fintech vertical, and I do I think I think one of the you know, it, it's always interesting. To we have Liberty Kafka, which is a recent client, right? We work with this. We have a connection to the, the Open Source Connect record framework, which is agnostic, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and support transformation. So, so I just wanted to dig in and see, you know, as, as Google, was there something that we're missing in my like, tech data that well, AA in the universe? I, I, is this just kind of like a way for you guys to streamline it? I think it's really that, right? Um, so you look at Kafka, I mean, this is what we've done is absolutely compatible with, with Kafka, right? So Kafka, I would see it as. One thing I like about Kafka is the concept of the schema registry. I think it's yeah. really, really important, right? So, so this is actually how you get to a low-code, hypermedia type application paradigm because the application itself just needs to know about its runtime context. It doesn't need, about, it needs to know a lot about uh, this stuff at build time. So, so in this case, you know, we have obviously our own preferences for you know, pub, you know, PubSub, and, and there's overlap in what they do, right? And um, you know, I, I think Matt said you know, PubSub is very ops light, but this is really meant to be sort of totally vendor agnostic, even almost technology agnostic, right? Carrier pigeons support this paradigm, you know, perfectly of uh, these abstractions. So it wasn't so much that a response to a tool, a single tool that wasn't there. It's sort of uh, a response to there's nothing to get this from point A, like, like that data doesn't transform itself. It's very hard at the hyperscaler level to actually say, make a commitment to a particular sort of niche vertical, right? Like, like you're never going to have an option in, in um, BigQuery that says upload fixed file, upload fixed messages, right? And I think that's okay, but when people want their fixed messages in BigQuery, somebody's got to get them there, and that's sort of the problem that we were solving. Yeah. And it's and, and it's it's maybe it's maybe a bit like a switch where we have a clearly defined list of inputs, a clearly defined list of outputs. You can you can say that you want some combination of you know schema and transport to end up as an Avro file and in a different kind of in a different kind of encoding. You can imagine we can imagine uh, a point where the community actually would would add Kafka as a as an as, as an output as, output as, as an input as an input transport type or as yeah. an output. Well, yeah, both. So basically, you specify like the abstractions with other applications that, that we had were things like input source or input file source or network source or output manager and then PubSub output manager, then Kafka output manager. You know, you can imagine this, right? And you could imagine basically uh, specifying your schema as connect to this namespace in the, in the schema registry and pull that, right? So there's a lot of things that one could do that. We're excited to sort of bring this to the open source community so other people could help as well. We're happy to talk, keep going afterwards. Yeah. I want to take two more questions if we have time. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you about the general manager. So what you described, what I just saw here is, is something that's valuable beyond just the trace Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And so that's, so I'm, not, I'm on more on the retail bank. Right? Yeah. Right? I've got a lot of messages. Right. It seems like this would be accurate. This, I mean, this was sort of born out of this use case in, of electronic trading because it was the one, I mean, you know, we, we focus on capital markets, right? 
this is a, a this is not just trading data. This is our experience with trade. So healthcare data. Imagine the value that you could have in healthcare if you have a shared schema. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. had a question back here. Um, one of the benefits of low content, this is high content, is uh, a really good it's like a signal to byte ratio. Yeah. How much you get impacted for a given NTU. I like I like that. I like that signal to byte ratio. That's great. Um, one of the as you transition from an unneeded to a metered environment, it's very interesting to know what side of that line you're you go from a highly efficient encoding for right, right, right. Absolutely. And and you know what my favorite thing is that putting gzip compression on JSON going over the days. Like, all right, now I'm wasting yeah, yeah, yeah. bytes and compute. Yeah. So but it works. I mean it, it has worked, right? I mean if you're basically doing CDNs, I mean it totally works. But as things get metered and people want to do things efficient, I mean literally I hate to say this, but it literally is more sustainable to use low context encodings. Oh no, I do. Like, like, like yeah. d you know, down to this, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it takes a while to get there. I think, I think the next crowd. Might yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to get out of here. Sorry, guys. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Thanks very much.